Coming up on this week in computer hardware, will Google Stadia streaming replace gaming consoles? Apple updates the iMac, iPad mini, and more. Snapdragon-powered VR does some desktop tricks. Razer Basilisk Essential and more, all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 509, recorded on March 21st, 2019, streaming with bated breath. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Helm. Take back your email and own your data with Helm, a secure personal server that enables you to own your online identity. For a limited time, save $50 off the Helm personal server by visiting thehelm.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show. The names bring you the most useful, most engaging, most informative, most delightful, and apparently this week the loudest uh, coverage of PC hardware, mobile hardware, console hardware, the Internet of Stuff, as we like to call it. But uh, we're going to start with, uh, well, actually, kind of the Internet of Stuff is involved here. Uh, Google's big announcement this week. Before I get to that, though, ladies and gentlemen, has anyone seen Mr. Sebastian Peake, editor-in-chief, PCPro.com? Mr. Mr. Peak, there he is. Greetings. Yes, Google I am here. Google Stadia. Google does on live slash mm -hmm. any of a number. I don't of think they crash. want that that term invoked at all. But yes, you know it's really not up to them. Um, but I I think their marketing department would hate that. Yeah, it was it was it, we were talking about this on on tech thing yesterday. Like the future of gaming is not a box. Hard it it's. You know, they're going to use their considerable computational power, a partnership with AMD, and they're promising to launch with uh, 4K HDR streams of AAA titles to your, well, your desktop, your laptop, your phone, your tablet, your aardvark, probably the dashboard of your Tesla, uh, certainly your television via a Chromecast. I'm joking about the dashboard of your Tesla uh, and aardvarks, but... Uh, yeah, it, it, some interesting stuff going on here. Uh, to kind of start backwards, I think the thing a lot of people are most excited about was the ability to start games instantly, to share game links, um, to give developers a new channel. That I think Google's more excited about than actual developers. But this is interesting, I think, only because it's Google. Um and Google thinks they can by dint of putting 7,500 edge nodes in 200 countries and leveraging their extraordinary existing network that allows you to do things like get answers on Google really quickly. Uh, they think they can beat the latency issues that have plagued on live and pretty much every other attempt to render in the cloud and then stream to your device, whatever that device might be. Um, this is big and complex to get really understaty for a moment. Yeah. On, on the hardware side, it's interesting because this is kind of taking that approach that Sony did with, you know, the PlayStation 4 where you take AMD graphics and you take a CPU, which in that case was also an AMD CPU. This may be an Intel CPU, which we're, it's kind of what we're reading between the lines here. It's, it's called only a custom x86 processor clocked at 2.7 gigahertz. But it, it the two share this massive 16 gigabyte pool mm -hmm. of ultra high bandwidth memory, which is kind of what we see with the PlayStation 4 architecture, where you've got this big pool of GDDR5 graphics memory between the CPU and GPU. And they're talking 10.7 teraflops of performance. The 56 compute units that suggests this is Vega 56, essentially, but right. coupled with a custom processor. That That's not insignificant. I mean, on desktop, that would be a fantastic, like, 1440 Ultra kind of gaming experience. And they're talking about, like, up to 4K gaming, which I'm sure is, like, 4K 30. You could definitely hit that. We saw some impressive stuff um, just this week with what a Vega 56 can do at like 4K 30. Well, we may or may not talk about that later with the <laughs> new Cry engine. But the I think the big issue with this, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, Patrick, is that regardless of what the underlying hardware is, and it is impressive that they're they're dedicating this kind of graphics hardware to an individual playing games, is the bottleneck. And that's that's 
going to be latency. And the numbers that I'm seeing from Digital Foundry, they're talking 166 millisecond latency, like total ping time. Whereas latency of a PC playing at 60 frames per second, they estimate to be about 79 milliseconds, which I'm sure is probably factoring in the actual latency of the display they're using, plus the overall latency mm -hmm. of just getting the rendered frames out uh, to the out of the graphics card and to the monitor. But that's that's about double the latency of a, a standard PC game. And, you know, still, still uh, like Xbox, the, the numbers from Xbox, like 145 milliseconds, that has to be factoring in a fairly uh, latent display in the chain as well. But what do you think? Like 166 milliseconds. <sighs> I, you know, the thing we've said about televisions is you want to get it as close to, you know, unless you are one of the sort of far end of the bell curve, you know, one, two, three, four, five percent of top end uh, gamers, especially esports gamers, um, 20 milliseconds, 20, 30 milliseconds is where people start recognizing latency uh, in some of the more um, uh, twitchy uh, games. And, uh, you know, 160 milliseconds sounds like forever. It would be unacceptable in a 4K television review or a 1080p television review in terms of latency. Um, you know, I'm curious, right? Because Google has, you know, a lot of money. They have a lot of willpower. Uh, they certainly permanently altered uh, the, you know, mobile world. Well, uh, above and beyond search and email and mobile with Android and several other things, right? This, this is a company that can do amazing things. Um, I'm curious whether or not this is going to this can actually work. I think it's going to work better in in you know 199 countries than it does in half of the United States because uh, of our our internet uh, infrastructure is so brutal in so many parts of the country. I'm really I mean I, I got to be honest with you, we don't know what the cost is going to be. We don't know what's, if there's going to be subscriptions. We don't have a launch date. We don't know the partners. Uh, you know other than you know, sort of Ubisoft and, uh, you know, uh, a Doom reboot from id to not, you know, take the glory away from anything involving Doom. Um, you know, we have so many, just so many answers are missing here, um, you know, that I, I hesitate. Great, this is awesome. Not really sure why they're doing this, except, uh, you know, uh, you know, one of the most thoughtful analysis I saw was uh, was up on the Verge, where they were basically like, "This is this isn't about gaming. This is about YouTube," um, which is, uh, uh, you know, took me a little while to, to wrap my head around uh, what Vlad Savov was getting to, um, you know. But uh, you know, it, it's more about sort of, you know, cutting out. Uh, Twitch, T W I T C H, the video gaming platform. I think that any actual need or desire to be involved in video, and also uh, because gamers and gaming and streaming gaming content has become so important online. Um, I mean, I'm really curious. The the remote, you know, the as you scroll a little bit farther, you'll see the remote that they announced, um, which we don't have a price for, and certainly looks like the strange offspring of a PS4 and an Xbox controller uh, by way of yeah. Big Hero 6's design team. Um, you know, there's an instant streaming button on there. There's a Google Assistant help button on there. Uh, it's connected via Wi-Fi, so they can connect it directly as an IoT device to the servers. They've certainly thought a lot about this, and they've certainly had a tremendous amount of success um, with Project Stream, which is the, uh, uh, I want to say the Assassin's, the Assassin's Creed uh, variation that, that streams in uh, uh, inside of uh, the Chrome browser. You know, so... They they've done a lot of homework on this. Um, I'm just really curious to see when it ships, what it costs. Uh, you know, do you have to buy individual games? Do you buy memberships to games? Do you get a flat fee? You know, that's some of the some of the pundits are like, oh, they're going to be the Netflix of gaming, and I'm like, well, yeah, that's a theory. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, they were also going to replace uh, you know Facebook and. Uh, Twitter and other things with their any of a number of, of failed social uh, uh, social applications that they've built over the years. So, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated. Uh, I also, you know, uh, a friend of a friend works uh, as an engineer in Google and he's like, they have amazing technology. 
lasers will fall from the sky, <laughs> eviscerating my core if I mention any of them. So people I know who are alarmingly bright are like, they're doing amazing things. So maybe they can, uh, you know, by sheer brunt of having all of the, you know, uh, all of the uh, resources to throw at the problem can do what OnLive couldn't do uh, as a startup. And apparently Sony can't do uh, to a certain degree, uh, despite being a rather enormous, uh, enormous uh, multinational corporation. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, I've given the, the amount of time where it's hard to stream uh, HD on Saturday night because everybody's sitting down and watching Netflix. <laughs> you know, it's just going to cause another, you know, another bump at three o'clock after all the schools shut down that the ISPs are going to have to deal with. I'm really, really curious uh, how, you know, how it rolls out, when it rolls out. And I got to be honest with you, what it costs, because, you know, Google's got a ton of money, but they're talking about building out some tremendously expensive uh, warehouses full of hardware. Yeah, the infrastructure based on just one of these instances where it's pretty high end as far as CPU and GPU, that's not inexpensive. And then I'm sure this is all going to be rolled into access to whatever library of games they have on offer. So it won't be cheap. But I have a, I mean, I, I look at it a couple different ways. One, that controller is fascinating to me because they are directly yeah. connecting the controller via Wi Fi and then that connects to the server. So there's, kind of a two different connections going on synchronously. But what if that does enable them to make the gameplay experience better? What if on the server side, they see the total latency round trip and then they they make the actual control input synchronized to the display on your end and make you feel like you're really controlling in real time without all that latency? That could be a game changer. The problem is that only works with single player. You get into multiplayer and unless everybody has the same latency that you have, then you're at a significant disadvantage if you're playing a twitchy shooter type game. And let's face it, the most the thing that's driving the game industry right now, or at least that everybody is seems to be the most interested in on a like a widespread, like mm -hmm. mainstream basis is battle royale games like Fortnite. Right. I saw PUBG explode, then Fortnite has taken over the world, it seems. And that is exactly an example of the kind of game that does not work with this. You but have man, that's where that's where Google can make it equal because they can give everybody they can monitor every single player's latency and slow it all down to the slowest player. <laughs> yeah, and, hey, and if that's what they do, if 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 you have, but the problem is, then it would be you. Fortnite would be you versus other people on Google Stadia and nowhere else. Right. So you're not. It, I feel like this is a tremendous demo and it, it sounds exciting especially you know we are going to be a lot harder on it than maybe like the average person who sees this on the news and says oh they're going to let me stream games i don't have to buy an expensive gaming computer takes away barriers to entry the controller is optional you can use whatever controller you have this sounds like it's going to work with virtually everything so just get yourself a usb game controller plug it into a tablet and you're good to go so that part of it is exciting and if you're just yes. playing single player games it as long as you don't have any significant lag between input and display. It'll feel great. It's just, it's almost like they devised this before the explosion of Battle Royale multiplayer online shooting okay. games that everything, it's, it's all about ping time. Like getting the lowest ping time is crucial because if you're still waiting, you may have already been shot before you even have a right. chance to react. <laughs> Your game is and over of course, before it's yeah. begun. No, I, then, I, I think you're right. Um, go ahead. I'm just thinking about internet speed. We talked about this a while back with 5G. Yeah. And the fastest country in the world for average internet speed is South Korea at around 28 megabits per second. And I'm looking at a chart right now like Andorra, Hong Kong, US, like 25 to 27 megabits per second. Uh, that is so much slower that that becomes the bottleneck whenever you bring networking into play with any kind of right. high performance computing or gaming because you know it's unthinkable these days to run a, a 100 megabit network in your home almost all networking equipment you buy even the inexpensive stuff is gigabit and now we're off to like 2.55 and 10 gigabit stuff coming down in price and now this is we're talking about a technology that relies on 
a, the inherently latent and far slower networking of whatever your ISP, ISP is providing. This would make a lot more sense if it was being bundled with Google Fiber, if that was right. in more markets, like a fiber exclusive gaming, you know, technology with virtually no latency and ultra high bandwidth. But except in summer when the pavement expands and the cable pops out. Right. I mean, they do have to go further than two inches. I think they've decided they, they need to go at least six inches below the uh, surface of the asphalt. Yes. No, I, no, I was just saying, you know, it's it's it, it's a case. Tremendous engineering company, all the resources. Um, but when the tremendous engineering resources hit uh, reality, things got a little complicated. Uh, weird and exciting news. Uh, Apple's updated its iMac lineup. Uh, basically, uh, new processors, kids. Um, <laughs> you know, up to eight core ninth gen Intel processors, Radeon Pro Vega graphics options. Uh, as Mac Rumors points out, nearly two years have passed since Apple last refreshed the iMac. Um, but finally, the 4K and the 5K models are getting some uh, hardware upgrades. Uh, I would go so far as to say needed, maybe not desperately needed, because for a lot of what people do, um, they were certainly fast enough, dot, dot, dot. Uh, but, you know, 3.2 gigahertz, 6 core, uh, HN core i7s with turbo boost up to 4.6 gigahertz on the uh, the big beast, or I know that's on the 4K, and then uh, 3.6 gig, 8 core, 9th gen core i9 uh, running up to 5 gigahertz and turbo boost for the 27 inch 5K iMac. Uh, these are not inexpensive, big shock. Uh, but what's crazy is you're, you're looking at yeah, I, I feel like Apple's been really smart about this. Like they, they held the processors in place for a really long time, and now that they've waited so long, you're looking at a 60% jump in performance on the 21.5 inch model. Uh, Mac rumors reports and something like 2.4 times faster, depending on what you're doing on the 27 inch iMac, because of all of those cores. So I'm I'm happy. Uh, for that. Uh, also, of course, they offer up to 64 gigabytes of RAM. These these make, for a lot of people, really, really, really nice editing systems if you want to get your Premiere or your Photoshop on on uh, on OS X. Um, so that's uh, that's exciting. The 21.5 inch uh, iMac starts at uh, $1,300 and the 27 inch 5K iMac starts at uh, a modest Eighteen hundred dollars, and those are actually available to order right now. And I gotta, I gotta do this while we're on camera. So Retina five K display, uh, six core processor, with up to four point six gigahertz, two terabytes of storage. Oh, I don't think they have the the super processor yet, but that's. Oh, here we go. Yes, the eight core ninth generation processor adds four hundred dollars, and I'm going to max it out with sixty four gigabytes of RAM, because I'm cruel. Dangerous. Uh, dangerous. Uh, you know, let's go for the Radeon Pro Vega 48 with 8 gigabytes of HBM2. Comes with a 2 terabyte Fusion Drive standard. We'll just leave it at that. And you know what? Let's put 1 terabyte of SSD in. Uh, and that's uh, $4,649. And we'll talk about it in a couple minutes. But, you know, there's a... It's not like memory's cheap right now. Um but you know the stock configuration of this is eight gigabytes, uh, sixteen gigabytes. Adding another eight gigabyte module is going to cost you another uh, hundred dollars. Thirty-two gigabytes is going to cost you an additional uh, six hundred dollars over the stock eight gigabyte configuration. So we're back in that that territory, uh, and I've I've tracked this over a long time. And sometimes Apple's uh, charging a perfectly reasonable amount or or something that's consistent with the PC market. But I think they're getting back to that edge where they're that side of things where they're really, really, really pushing the margins on parts here. Because to go from a two terabyte fusion storage drive to a one terabyte SSD drive is $500. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, remember that number, because we'll be, we'll be referring to that later on. Uh, the other thing that happened uh, this week was a 2019 iPad mini was dropped. I had no idea it had been three years since the last uh, update to the Mini. Same 7.9 inch screen, except that it's 25% brighter. Uh, they've expanded the color gamut on the new glass. They've added an A12 Bionic chip. The whole thing is $399. No face ID, and the bezels, uh, by contemporary standards, are quite large. Um, 
you know, the iPad Air with the A12 is $499 with a somewhat bigger screen. Uh, one of the things a friend of mine was telling me is iPad minis are showing up in a lot of sort of vertically integrated businessy kind of areas. Uh, so it almost, you know, it, it still has a lightning connector. They haven't gone to USB-C. So there was kind of the idea that, you know, there's a lot of existing applications for this in corporate environments, and they just want something they can slot in that's faster, but doesn't require them to create or recreate or replace any of the infrastructure that they use for the devices. Um, yeah, and, and by the way, the somewhat slower but somewhat larger 9.7-inch entry-level iPad is still sitting there at $329. So haven't had a lot of tablet news so I was excited to talk about that. <laughs> no, and it's it's nice at least to see that what they've essentially done is trickle down the earlier iPad Pro down to iPad yeah. level, so you get the higher performance, and you know hitting that price point. But it's one of those not very exciting iterative updates that we expect from Apple, mm -hmm. but maybe on a more frequent basis than this, because they've been letting their, especially on the desktop, like you were talking about the iMac, they let those kind of languish for a couple or even three years. We don't even yeah. talk about the Mac Mini, how long that had to languish, but forever, <laughs> just languished forever. Um, you guys were talking about this on PC Per earlier this week. Uh, I'm still trying to to wrap my skull around the idea that uh, Nvidia is going to bring uh, essentially ray tracing to GTX cards. Um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense in terms of, of encouraging developers to do ray tracing or RTX compatible stuff. Uh, but I got to say, I was a little surprised. <laughs> it, it, I think the first inkling we got that they might be, I don't know if backpedaling is the right word, but they've certainly seemed to be listening to some of the outcry I don't know how widespread it is, but certainly within our industry and the comments that we have and our readers who say that they don't see any need, you know, right now for these RTX features. They don't think it's worth the trade-off in performance. Right. Uh, there have obviously now been questions about DLSS, and I I didn't catch every moment of uh, NVIDIA CEO Jinxing Wang's uh, keynote, but I don't believe he was talking about DLSS at all. It seems like okay. they're just kind of moving on from that a little bit, at least currently, while it's while it matures. But without DLSS, the performance, as we've talked about in the past, with ray tracing features is not great, especially right. at higher resolutions. And the amount of money you need to spend on the hardware to make the to get to those acceptable frame rates is pretty considerable. An RTX 2080 is a $700 product. So it made sense to offer non-ray trace touring products, which they did. The 16 series, the 1660 Ti, and the 1660 that we've been talking about over the last month. But, you know, ultimately, the shaders that make up these products, they are programmable shaders. That's been the industry norm for like 10, 15 years now. So <laughs> it, it was not out of the realm of possibility for them to just turn on the ability for some of those shaders to do the work of some of these uh, RT cores. And while the RTX implementation is faster. We'll do our own testing here to validate NVIDIA's numbers, but it seems pretty obvious that the cores being built right into the GPU right. with those bigger dies, with the bigger uh, touring products like the, the 2080, 2080 Ti, you're not going to see that level of performance even when you're comparing it against a GTX 1080 Ti. And that's what they were doing on these charts uh, they showed basically the the mainstream titles that utilize RTX features currently, like Battlefield, Metro Exodus, and now Shadow mm -hmm. of the Tomb Raider, which got those features enabled. And you're getting up to 3x the performance by using their RTX 2080 versus that 1080 Ti. However, that is with DLSS. If you do not use DLSS, the difference becomes a lot smaller than I was expecting it to be. We're talking about like maybe in Battlefield, it's only like it's less than 1x difference. So, you know, it, it is significantly faster to use the 2080, but without the added performance uplift of DLSS, uh, the difference is not as huge. And so it, if nothing else, this provides 
what I think they should have kind of done from the outset, which was let's allow users of these GeForce cards to experience real-time ray tracing at home. And if they're excited about it, if they think it's worth it, if the games come out and the, you know, the feature is there and they, they can demo it at home, then maybe they'll be encouraged to go out and spend the money on that 20 series card because they want those higher frame rates. They want to get to 60 frames per second with, <laughs> with uh, RTX features enabled. Kind of like back in the day, like Doom <clears throat> comes out and right. maybe your system could only play Doom at 10 frames per second. It might be worth a CPU upgrade to get to like 15 or maybe 20 frames per second, but people could still play it. They could get excited about it and it drove hardware upgrades. The problem was here, they introduced the hardware first right. and then the software had to kind of follow. Like It's like they were introducing like the hero device I, I think about the iPhone launch in 2007. Steve Jobs waving the iPhone in the air and saying, you know, this is what you want. This this is a game changer. This this is everything that you, you know, that's the phone. It's the internet in your pocket. It's your music player and creating a market <laughs> for smartphones. It obviously followed. But at the outset, it was a very expensive phone at $600. And there was no app ecosystem yet. So it wasn't like they were just tapping into an existing market. They were creating a market. And NVIDIA did a similar thing with the RTX launch last fall. And it's like games to follow. Here's this demo that we have with a Port Royal demo from 3D Mark that's not available yet. And it's not in any games. And then they added it to Battlefield. And that was the <laughs> only one. And we watched Battlefield demos on loop. And yeah, the reflection in that fender does look a lot better, and the puddles shine a little bit nicely. You know, <laughs> the it wasn't, puddles shine just a little more brightly. The rain yeah, sparkles like, just a little more. Yeah, no, it, I'm, it's, I'm with it's you. It's not compelling when it's you. You show picture A and picture B, and even a static image, you have to stare at it and say, "Oh, yeah, I can see the." It's a little bit. I guess the sun is a little bit like more subtle in this one versus that one, and it really depends on the game and how they're yeah. using it. It's a thin line, dude. Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I was just laughing because even in that first graphic, tens of millions of DXR GPUs, and it's you know basic RT effects, low ray count. And I'm like, if you're not particularly bowled over by complex RT effects and multiple RT effects and high ray counts, imagine how underwhelmed you'll be with this new technology when it's you know patched onto your existing GPU. Um, uh, and, you know, you know I, yeah, we, we could be snarky. I could be snarky and say, and of course, these underwhelming effects also come with a huge performance penalty. So, right. So, yeah, you know, we wait again with bated breath. This is one of those shows where sort of the theme is going to be, boy, there's a lot of cool stuff that will ship eventually. Um <laughs> I was pretty stoked about the uh, NVIDIA's Creator Ready Driver program. That actually seemed really interesting to me. Um, as as somebody who knows a lot of people who want to do quadro type things on GeForce type cards or bounce in between uh, those arenas, depending on whether they're using a system at home or a system uh, at a employer's uh, uh, workshop, workspace, office, uh, to get staggeringly old-fashioned about it. But this is uh, announced at uh, Game Developer Conference 2019. Um, you know, we usually download game-ready drivers from NVIDIA, but the idea is, is that uh, the creator every drivers are going to, and I'm going to quote Scott over at PC Bar on this one, be released according to the release schedule of popular creative tools, and they will receive more strict testing with creative applications. So immediately, you're already talking about a 13% performance increase with the Blender Cycles renderer, eight or ten, somewhere between eight and nine percent uh, for Cinema 4D, Premiere, Premiere Pro, and Photoshop. Uh, you know, compared to the previous generation 415 GeForce drivers, um, you choose which one you want to install based on GeForce experience. The Creator Ready drivers are supposed to support all the awesome from the game ready drivers. So I am, uh, I am fascinated. So. Very, thoughtful. Very yeah. thoughtful. It reminds me of what we saw from AMD just after the, the Radeon 7 launch where they had pro driver support for the Radeon 7, which ended up kind of being 
uh, it was a different story because they came out and they had to clarify it. They weren't certifying it the same way. It was just kind of that you could use a Radeon 7 under the Pro Driver stack. But this is an interesting idea from NVIDIA where instead of focusing on game performance, you have a more regular release schedule and you focus on new releases of or updates to things like, you know, Adobe Creative Cloud, Blender. And if if you are simply zeroing in on performance in applications and ignoring games, then it seems like they are... It's interesting that they're be able to eke out even double digit increases like they uh, apparently are. So that's fascinating. Like you install this driver with this card, and these are for regular desktop cards. Like when I first saw this, I thought, oh, this is like Quattro. No, this is desktop GTX RTX cards of recent vintage. And install this driver. And if you're not gaming on the machine, if this is a production machine, you'll see improvements. This is a good thing. That's all I'm going to say. It's good to make things run better. Man, uh, VR announcements this week. Uh, <sighs> some delightful surprises, actually, the week of uh, Game Developers Conference. Uh, CNET's got an exclusive on this one. Scott Stein wrote it up. Uh, new Snapdragon-powered VR and AR headsets will double as wireless VR for PCs starting this year. Is this the future of Oculus, Vive, and even HoloLens? Um you know, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what else to say. Balance XR for PC, uh, Snapdragon 845, wireless 802.11ad, uh, which means you're you're theoretically getting a 60 gigahertz connection to a PC, or if it's ready to communicate with it, a console. Actually, you're going to need additional, uh, uh, you know, support to get this in a PC or a console. Um, you know, so it's. Interesting also because it is sort of a, you know, it is a standalone device, it doesn't require external hardware, it doesn't require a PC like the Oculus Quest, but I don't believe this is the Oculus Quest. And um, the thing that's kind of fascinating, I think, is that, you know, it is a standalone device. However, when you are near your PC, you can use the wireless connection to your PC to use the superior GPU inside your PC to do the awesome. Uh, not that they got in super deeply into the details of what's going on with that one. Um, but, uh, you know, pretty much the, the PC streams graphics to the headset. The headset does six degrees of freedom and the room tracking. Uh, I, I'm excited. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this comes back a little bit to our initial conversation about Stadia because... If they are streaming this from the PC, then that requires a tremendous amount of bandwidth, which obviously the latest Wi-Fi standards have quite a bit to spare. Right. So I'm seeing, what is it? Wireless connection have a 16 millisecond latency, according to Qualcomm. So at 16 milliseconds, you're not going to see that as much, but you know, latency is paramount with VR. So as long as it doesn't affect the experience to the point where you know, they, they don't like to talk about motion sickness and that sort of thing, but I would be curious to see how it all kind of plays out. The most impressive demo I've ever had for VR to this date is uh, a prototype headset. I think it was an Oculus headset that had uh, VR, like the uh, eye tracking built in so that what you were looking at was was uh, controlled by eye movements instead of having to move your entire head around, which significantly mm -hmm. cut down, at least for me, that sort of sick feeling that I got after a while when I tried traditional VR headsets, so... Right. Um, that's that's what I get excited about when I hear about improvements or new generations of these things. But obviously, not having to be tethered to a bunch of cables because that's been the experience so far. You have a high-end gaming system, which is not inexpensive. And then you're tethered to a whole bunch of cables. And then we saw some of the just ridiculous attempts. Companies had literal backpack PCs at CES a couple of years ago <laughs> where you're still tethered to a cord or you can run it on battery for like 20 minutes because it's literally a desktop computer on your back. But. <laughs> Several minutes of sparkling gameplay before returning for a recharge. Um, you know, this is, you know, the Snapdragon 820 was inside the Oculus Go, 835 was in the Mirage Solo, the HTC Vive Focus, the Oculus, Oculus Quest. Uh, 
uh, or at least the, the sort of standalone designs around the 835. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, I'm also kind of curious what it's going to take to get 802.11 AD uh, running because um, that is uh, something I'm not supremely familiar with. I've been <laughs> most of my learning new uh, specs has been 802.11 AX. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I, I keep thinking it's going to be it's going to be a good year for gaming. Um, and it's been interesting also uh, to watch. We're already seeing some exclusive titles uh, being announced for the Oculus Quest, um, which uh, we'll get into closer to the Oculus Quest actual launch date. But if you like dancing you know, with lightsabers, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'll, I'll just quickly add that it is interesting when you think about this being a kind of all-in-one powered by a smartphone SOC because those are really powerful. I've not had hands-on with any kind of uh, Snapdragon 855 uh, yet. I think the 835 was the last launch that I attended. But Adreno graphics, the graphics built into Snapdragon processors are extremely powerful and they've just been getting more and more powerful and you have like when you think about a smartphone, these are extremely pixel dense displays, where a, a, a typical Android phone, like a higher end handset, like from Samsung, is like twenty eight eighty by uh, fourteen forty resolution. So it's if you're playing games at native resolution on those phones, that is a, you're thinking in terms of like on the desktop side, fourteen forty p gaming at high detail settings still requires a pretty beefy video card. You still got to go two, three hundred dollars right. on the graphics card to even play that at acceptable frame rates. So it's impressive what they can do in something that's obviously so small and consumes so little power. And I think ideally from the outset, that's what uh, VR headsets would have been. Like the idea that you have to tether it to a traditional desktop box is very inelegant. It was right. never I'm sure, the vision from the beginning. I uh, also would like to point out, 8211 AD uh, <laughs> announced in 2016. Uh, I'm pretty sure these headsets will probably come bundled with some kind of a dongle device or card because uh, this is 60 gigahertz bandwidth. So super high, super short range uh, devices that offer like seven gigabytes per second of bandwidth, but over a, a short and, as far as I can tell, unstated distance. So I'm guessing you're going to be in the same room with your PC uh, and probably not a huge room, uh, a large room probably. Um, yeah, I, I was, because originally I saw that, I was like, is that a typo for 802.11ax? But uh, yeah, I am, uh, I am fascinated. And we wait with bated breath. Because that's the theme this week. <laughs> so many things to look forward to. Uh, Oculus Rift S was also announced. Um, the next generation Oculus Rift. Apparently they've pretty much pulled all production of Oculus Rift offline for this one. Uh, inboard cameras, a single thin cable. Uh, finally they've upped the displays to 1280 by 1444. One for each eyeball. $399 available this spring. Oddly enough around the time the Quest launches. And again, this will replace the current Rift. So, I think VR is either going to have a big year or a very, very bad year this year. <laughs> I don't know how else to express it. Yeah, they, they cut costs. I mean, they're, they've switched from OLED, which was kind of a big thing, down to LCD. Right. So, that helps with cost. But, you know, at $399, they're not, I'm sure they're not implementing any, like, exciting new technology. It's not going to have eye tracking or any of that kind of stuff. It's just... Thinner, lighter, but that's what it's supposed to be. It's the S. It's like the right. the slim, less expensive model. This is a good thing. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, did you see the announcement for the Xbox One S, i.e., the Xbox without the disc drive, or I should say the optical disc drive, or optical disc I, slot, as the case may be? Yeah, I. Did not well. I guess it hasn't officially launched yet, has it? But no, yeah, I heard reports about this, which I, you know, at first I'm thinking I I hate this. You know, there's you get tied into the ecosystem. You can't even buy the games, and of course they don't. With the the current state of things, with access codes and you know one time use uh, passes, and basically being unable to to resell your games on the used market the way they used to be able to anyway. 
plus day one updates are kind of like what sold it to me. Like, okay, if you're going to buy a game and then you install it and the first thing you have to do is download 40 gigabytes, which essentially re-downloads and installs the game over again on launch day, <laughs> then what's the point of the disc? On my PS4, uh, I already find it a lot more convenient to just have the game in my digital library. That way I don't have to switch discs. Right. So, Fine. Disc hater. I, I love this. Hey, I'm I'm pro optical media, Patrick. I still buy Didn't movies like on Blu-ray. <laughs> but for games, I mean, it, right. okay, when I buy it, if I buy a Criterion Collection Blu-ray, uh, it's going to give me great picture quality and sound. I'm not. Right. You don't have you to know. re-download the entire 45 gigabytes before you play right. it the first time because they had an unreasonable shipping deadline and just shipped a disc. And then shipped patches the size of the contents of the disc to fix all of the broken code that left the CD printing factory. Yes. I don't even use BD yeah. Live features. So <laughs> I'm, I'm happily uh, unplugged when it comes to my movie watching. I have to share this legendary PlayStation video. This is how you share your games on PS4. <laughs> Sharing the game. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> Very nice. Sharing the game means handing the disc to your friend. The best part about I'm discs. Sure, I'm sure the uh, developers love this idea. <laughs> oh, yeah, just buy one copy and then share it with all your friends. Everybody should be forced to buy their own disc immediately. Yes, that will be the future. Straight to the past. Oh my goodness. This week, this episode, this particular moment of this episode this week in computer hardware brought to you by Helm. Speaking of the future, if you're uptight, Google owns my 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 email, my docs, my spreadsheets. I watch my video there. They've got the, my music. Now they want the, my video. Oh my God, are you tired? Is it time to take back your email? It's time to live on your own terms online. They Helm did something really cool. It's a personal server that allows you to easily own and manage your online identity, starting with your email, your calendars, and your contacts. Three things that are deeply personal and deeply revealing and deeply frightening, especially if you're in business. You don't want that information to get out. And, you know, did you ever wonder, like, where where is my email? The most critical data stored on massive corporate servers outside your home, leaving you vulnerable to hacks and surveillance. Do you want to feel safe and secure online, wherever you are in the world? Communicate with confidence, free from the threat of hacking, corporate data aggregation, government surveillance. You can now bring as many email domains as you like into Helm. And with Helm, you can now manage unlimited domains, email accounts, aliases, and easily set up multiple users from a single device. It's simple. It's so easy to set up. It took like five minutes. You can access it anywhere in the world. Uh, they're running like DMARC, SPF, DKIM, email authentication. They're serious about their, their the security of their email systems. There's 128 gigabytes of solid state storage on board, so you have a ton of space, and it's fast. And Helm engineered this from the ground up to secure, protect, and give you control of your data. The disk is fully encrypted. The keys are managed by a secure enclave. They have a secure boot. They do server-to-server -server encryption over TLS. They're using Let's Encrypt for their certificates. Um, they use some really slick proximity-based two-factor authentication through the Helm app to, to make it even harder to spoof the device. They offer a VPN tunnel, encrypted offsite backups that only you can access. You have a unique private security key. So Helm, <laughs> all they got is a bunch of deeply encrypted bits that they can't do anything with. And on March 26, Helm's adding secure file and photo sharing, backup, and view powered by NextCloud. This is so cool. Helm customers can easily upload and view their files and photos securely on their Helm personal server with automatic file backup through synchronization. File management is fast, easy, and secure. It's just, this, uh, you know, it, email is just the start. Do an email right. Now they're actually going to make it easier for you to keep your photos, your life private. I love this. Privacy is a right, not a setting. Protect what matters with Helm. For a limited time, save $50 off the Helm personal server by visiting thehelm.com slash twitch. But don't wait. This offer is only valid for a limited time. That's thehelm.com slash T-W-I-C-H. And we thank Helm for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. You were you were excited about this. Uh, you were running benchmarks with Tom Clancy's The Division Two, 
And you were discussing if this was uh, kind of hard on the GPUs. Yeah, when you really push the detail settings, it is. This is one of those games where right away, I think reviewers around the web found that you have to basically go up to ultra detail settings if you're using a preset to really push it. It seems that these last couple of uh, higher profile Ubisoft titles that are quite uh, AMD friendly, like the this game and uh, Far Cry 5 both have like the Radeon branding when you boot them up and they've been very well optimized for Radeon graphics. That was kind of the focus of this is seeing here's another game that should be well enough optimized that it will create a level playing field for all the graphics cards out there, which was mostly the case. You're going to see a lot of uh, cards of similar price points uh, or similar power clustered next to each other on these charts. But putting the game up to its ultra settings, I tried it at uh, 2560 by 1440 first just to get an idea of like how the, the mainstream cards that are currently on the market stack up. And I didn't use any of the 10 series Pascal cards as those kind of disappear or are marked up on the marketplace. So we're just talking like 16 series and 20 series NVIDIA cards and then the current offering from AMD up to the Radeon 7. And just going down as far as like the 200-ish dollar price point with the RX 580, still seeing very, very playable frame rates down at the RX 580 level, which, I mean, to be able to play at 2560 by 1440 at ultra detail settings and still get about 40, 45 frames per second out of a card that at the time I published this was selling for 187 bucks is right. pretty impressive. And, and that jumps, of course, well into that 60 frames per second range when you lower the detail settings down or, or lower the resolution down to 1080p. So... Actually, a pretty surprisingly easy on your system, the Division 2. Uh, and only hmm. really punishes when you use the absolute highest detail settings. And still, you know, very impressive showing. And what I kind of felt was the sweet spot was the Vega 56, which is funny. Because I was thinking, man, Vega 56, right around 65 frames a second at 1440 Ultra... And though those cards have been selling for between like 269, 289 with or without rebate. I think the current offer is 289. And it, it outperforms a $350 RTX 2060 card in this game. And then, of course, the news of Google Stadia breaks and they're using basically a Vegas 56. So, I mean, this is a legitimate GPU and offers really good performance. But what was fascinating to me, two things, and I don't know if I mentioned it in the article specifically, but one thing the Division 2 really does push is video memory. It's the first game where I was seeing it exceed four gigabytes of memory, even at 1080 Ultra. And usually at 1080, I think in Far Cry 5, the most I could get out of 1080 was three, three and a half gigabytes if you max everything out and use the HD textures. Mm -hmm. And this game... Uh, I tried just one four gigabyte card just to see how it could how it would work, and it was uh, I think it was a 1050 Ti with four gigabytes I have, and I absolutely hit a ceiling where it was it was hitting the ceiling and dropping, and then it would it was like up and down, up and down. You could see it very clearly on the screen as it was happening, and I looked at the logs afterwards, and I was hitting that four gigabyte frame buffer barrier. So definitely want frame buffer for this. You don't have to have the strongest GPU. You can even go out and get like an RX 580, which gives you 8 gigabytes of memory for about 190 bucks on Amazon right now. And that'll play this just fine. Like that gave me 65 frames a second on average uh, at 1080 Ultra. So just kind of interesting to see like not too hard on the GPU, pretty hard on graphics memory, especially at these higher detail settings. <laughs> so Good to know. Uh, we were talking... Uh yesterday actually because is I got in a slightly less fast uh, a slightly less fabulous uh, GTX 1660 from MSI the Ventus OC and it was fascinating to me to see how little throttling up uh, the frequency on the memory how little it actually impacted some basic benchmark scores and you had mentioned this uh, as being something I could throw at that to abuse the memory and, and see how uh, what kind of performance boost I could get out of turning up or th turning up the memory clock on that one um, it's interesting and is this available as a standalone benchmark or is this built into the game you have to purchase the game first 
it's built into the game. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it runs as its own, you know, pre predefined benchmark like, as we've seen from a number of games, but yeah, you have to, you have to spend this, the 50 or $60 on the game to get it. It is one of the better ones as far as pre built benchmarks go like the pre baked or canned benchmarks as they're called, because it, it goes through four different stages unbroken and really does uh, provide enough of a mix where there's one that's there's one scene that's extremely heavy with foliage as you're kind of going through trees and bushes and the camera passes right through uh, leaves and things and and there's water effects and there's uh, some scenes that are very heavily populated with uh, character models and some that are not so it's it's a good overall mix that runs for like a good two two plus minutes straight um, and a lot of the benchmarks that are out there, uh, they'll show you like a scene and then it like goes to black for a moment. Like the shadow of the tomb Raider benchmark, not one of my favorites because you get like 40 <laughs> seconds, pause, 35 seconds, pause a minute and a half. So to see a benchmark like this, that's just kind of an unbroken walk through what the game is really like, like what you'll actually encounter if you're actually, you know, playing this game single player. So. Sounds excellent. Razor Basilisk, Essential Gaming Mouse, uh, Christopher Koch did the review up on PCPro.com. Um, this is essentially Razor doing a mouse that doesn't make your heart stop when you see the price of it. Uh, and also, I will say, as someone who is not a huge fan of people turning, uh, you know, Millennium Falcon-esque sharp-edged designs into things I hold in my hands for hours at a time, a relatively comfortable-looking mouse. Yeah. That it, well, if you're right-handed, I'll point that out right off the bat. This is one of those ergonomically designed mice that assumes that you have that you're using your right hand. But with that out of the way, he, he was uh, Chris was impressed with this. He he points out that it's hitting that lower price point for Razer. Um, they're kind of on the higher end when it comes to gaming peripherals. So forty nine ninety nine, while by far not the cheapest gaming mouse on the market, does tie for their lowest priced offering so you're getting basically a, a a slightly lower end version of the basilisk which is one of their i think 70 dollars mice mm -hmm. that just has like a lower uh a slightly lower end uh sensor in it so you're at like i think it's 6400 dpi instead of like sixteen thousand. you see from some of the really high-end sensors that are out there it's still a one you know gigahertz polling rate uh, he, he even did some checking in this review with a uh, mouse rate checker and has some graphs on here. Got very in-depth with this mouse. I was impressed. Is showing like results, like accuracy results of different DPI settings and mm -hmm. scatter plot graph results. And that's the only time you really see like a, a major difference. And it was, it was still pretty slight. Like, yeah, the higher end sensor was a little bit more accurate at this polling rate or I mean, at this uh, resolution than this one, but... You get what you pay for when you get those much more like the higher end sensors. But in this market, we see quite a few of these. I've, I've looked at a couple HyperX mice recently. I've seen some stuff with these 6400 DPI sensors. And it's that's kind of where this one is as far as that level of performance. And if you like the Razer styling and you like the software, there's a lot of customizability inherent with these products. And it gives you a lower cost option. You can get in the door with a Razer mouse for 50 bucks now or less. I mean, I'm sure street prices will be lower than the 49.99 eventually. But otherwise, you know, nice feel, kind of a grippy material, you know, overall good performance for a mouse at this price level. Yay. <laughs> it's a mouse. It doesn't suck. Yeah, it's, it's hard to... Uh, Romanticize a mouse review, but uh, sure you can. Just treat it like it's wine. The sensual echoes of top class firearms were reflected in the matte surface of the mouse. It's my fingers. Wait, are we talking about tickle. RTX again? Uh, something the like uh, <laughs> Basilisk <laughs> RTX. I'm mocking a certain style of review from the audio industry. We won't get into that. Uh, we got a great tweet from uh, at Nerd1701. Doug says, your elusive 10 cent a gigabyte SSD is here. 
and send a link to a Newegg promotional email, which sadly I did not get despite being a subscriber. Um, starts with a uh, Intel 60, 660p M.2 one terabyte PCI Express drive for $102.99 and uh, scrolls right on down to uh, ADATA's uh, uh, 960 gigabyte SATA 3 drive for $95 and a Crucial MX500 uh, 250 gigabyte SATA drive, which I don't think is in the, t oh, for $50. So that's uh, five cents a gigabyte, uh, if I'm doing math correctly, for the 250 gigabyte version. And then the one terabyte version of that is selling for $139, which is roughly uh, 14 cents a gigabyte. Which is not 10 cents a gigabyte, but is awfully close. So I'm stoked. <laughs> More, yeah, better, the 10 faster, cents, cheaper hardware. That 10 What's cent that? total is, it's like the, the holy grail. And, and yes. of course, once we get there, it's going to be like, well, I want 5 cents a gigabyte. But we've seen, we, we've had to go up to 2 terabytes to get it, though, which is kind of sad. But that is quite a deal. On that drive. It's too bad yes. we don't have the email because it's one of those deals from Newegg where you have to have the email because they compare your code against your email address when you log in. Well, I'm getting the sales. Maybe I'm getting I'm logged into my Newegg account and I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing that two hundred fifty gigabyte drive for fifty dollars. I'm seeing the Intel six sixty P for hundred and fourteen dollars. And that would appear to be Oh yeah, I that's, think that's pretty yeah. close. It's not quite ten cents, but it's close. You know, twelve cents. That eight out of drive is awfully close to ten cents. In any case, at least on sale at Newegg, <laughs> you can get down below like fourteen cents a gigabyte. Uh, we got a nice uh, email from Janet who wrote Twitch at twit TV, where you too can send questions if you like. She says, I heard Patrick talking about Crucial's NVMe price on the one terabyte SSD for $200 or so. And of course, the price has since dropped uh, considerably. She bought a uh, ADATA for $150 at Thanksgiving, which also has dropped precipitously down to like $100 uh, or actually $95 we're looking at there. Uh, and I'm closing my user benchmark, taking Gander at this. And the user benchmark is showing some basically like, you know, how it scales against a standard device. Uh, but the big thing is that the, the ADATA. NVMe PCI Express drive is considerably faster than the SanDisk Extreme Pro or the uh, Seagate desktop uh, drive in there. And Jenna writes, the only problem I found is that I cannot figure out how to boot from this drive and use the A drive for games. Nothing is overclocked and likely way over my needs. And I would say that this is a always it's always a good time to back your system up, back the data off of your system, uh, put the drive you want, you know, in and then freshly install Windows or for that matter OS 10 or Linux onto that drive. Uh, I always, whenever possible, you can use, there is software you can use to migrate your existing operating installation onto, do it like a bit perfect copy uh, where it aligns everything, even if the drive, the old drive is smaller or larger than the new drive. Um, but uh, I prefer whenever possible to when I'm switching to a new drive to take that as an opportunity to blow out Windows because Windows tends to cruft up over time. Um, and, you know, <laughs> there's just things break. Um, you know, it's a giant collection of code. It gets modified. It gets tweaked. It gets manipulated uh, both intentionally and legitimately by uh, 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 software developers and not so uh, intentionally or legitimately or very intentionally but not so legitimately by people who are trying to do nefarious and, and nasty things on your system with viruses and other rootkits and such but uh, uh, I would be I would back your data up I would get your Windows installation key and I would do a fresh install on that new drive and uh, you will notice things are very very fast and your boot up times will probably decrease too uh, in a good way so Janet says, Happy New Year's, boys, and we're going to say Happy New Year's back to you, and hopefully uh, this helps you out a bit. But yeah, do a fresh install. That's my favorite. I bless Sebastian, speechless. <laughs> no, I, I'm always in favor of the fresh install, but I'm just thinking I'm having flashbacks of all the times I've recommended this and the looks that I get from people. It's just kind of like this, oh, no, 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 no. 
I don't want to lose anything. And I'll reassure them. No, no, you won't lose anything. And of course, after <laughs> I blow away windows and like, hey, look, all your pictures and documents are back. Well, where's, where's Microsoft office? I don't know. Where's your Microsoft office CD? I don't know. I need word. Like, <laughs> well, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you now. And oh, where's this application? Where's that application? Like it's not there anymore. Cause I erased your hard drive and I only saved your documents and photos. So it can be well, scary, but we can get you through this, you know, just back everything up, back, back everything up that you think you need. And then everything that you don't think you'll need. Right. It's actually, ideally you'd make, you'd clone the entire drive as a backup. Yeah. And there's free tools out there. I like to use this thing called Clonezilla open source. Clonezilla is amazing. Yeah. It's basically the open source version of uh, Norton ghost or something where you just bit for bit, copy the drive onto another drive. And that's what I do when I start over on the same drive. But when you buy a new drive, that's, you know, you have so many options. You can use it as a big like Steam uh, game drive or something like that where Steam makes it very easy because when you install a game with a client like that, it asks you what the destination is. And then if you say, oh, well, it's this new E drive I just installed, pops up as E. Once it gets formatted, then suddenly you have a Steam folder on that drive and it offloads it off of your main OS drive. But it does, they make it easier to uh, move things around because you can reinstall from a backup, which you have to expressly create. But, you know, in general, installing games to drive mm -hmm. letters here and there create some complexity and irritation if you ever do end up having to uh, back up and restore your whole system. So, like Patrick said, if you've got a really, really fast new drive with a lot of space, like that one terabyte SSD, a clean install of Windows will just be lightning fast and any of maybe some of those nagging problems you may have had with fresh windows install, fresh drivers, everything up to date, your system is just going to fly and then you don't have to worry about drive letters yeah. and changing installation paths. I was actually really hoping when I saw a drive, I'm like, yes, a drive. That's my kind of gaming, but I don't know if they're actually just playing floppy disk games. Like I might <laughs> always awkward. Um, yeah. You know, the, if there's a lot of tools out there, uh, easiest has a really, uh, Excellent set of tools and partition manager to help you migrate. And if you'd like some hand-on help from some very trustworthy people, um, Whitson Gordon and David Murphy uh, did an article on Lifehacker. I don't know if it's an update to Whitson's article that David Murphy did, but uh, it was the last update was uh, 822-2018, and it's how to migrate to a solid-state drive without reinstalling Windows. There it is. Um, yeah, it was originally written in April 2013, and then David Murphy updated it uh, last summer. And uh, that is actually a really excellent walkthrough on how to uh, how to use Macrium Reflect to move all the old stuff onto the new fast drive. So, and then you can you know carefully guard your old drive until the new drive is running securely and awesomely, uh, or just keep it as a backup, <laughs> which would be strange, but. Also, strangely, effective. you know, it's it's not a bad idea because you buy these external hard drive enclosures on, uh, you know, they usually cost around ten dollars or so. Yeah. And you just pop your old if you have a two and a half inch drive, like it's especially easy. But you pop your old drive into these things if you're on a laptop or if you have a SSD that you're replacing, it's it's bus powered. And then you just have this external drive you can plug into whenever you mm -hmm. want to and gives you that peace of mind. If you forgot an important document like, oh, no, there was a folder on my desktop. I didn't back up my desktop folder and it's still there. <laughs> of course, we're hoping you're also backing up to like a a NAS and have some sort of offline, like online backup too. But right, that's another issue. We'll talk about that another day. Uh, so, one of the other stories we, we I was mentioning with that we talk about uh, the cost of of storage uh, on Apple products right now. Um, one of the other articles, 95 pack, 925 Mac, posted this week was Apple lowering the price of SSD upgrades for Mac Mini, MacBook Air, and MacBook Pro. And this is pretty brutal, right? Uh, the base model MacBook Air, uh, 1.5 terabyte SSD is $1,100, down from $1,200. A 256 gigabyte uh, SSD is $200. A 512 gigabyte SSD is $400. And then uh, the MacBook Air a 1.5 terabyte SSD upgrade is uh, $900 down from $1,000. And the 512 gigabyte upgrade is a much more modest $200. And they've got information on the Mac Mini and uh, the MacBook Pro. 
Um, I just want to point out that these these are, you know, in a world where you can pick up a one terabyte NVMe drive for two hundred fifty dollars, this seems excessive. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, it's really unfortunate for the consumers that, mo well, it's it's not just an Apple thing, but a lot of these thin and lights right. use soldered memory, so there's no upgrade for memory. I was you just have to about order to mention it. that. Yeah, but. With the solid state drives, almost any laptop you buy other than a MacBook, you're going to be able to go out and get a faster NVMe drive or a larger NVMe drive for it. And those have just kind of become the standard. And unfortunately, even though it's not necessarily soldered to the board, Apple does use a proprietary drive. And mm -hmm. the connector is slightly different. You can't just go get like an M key off the shelf NVMe drive and put it in a MacBook and have it work. And if you look at pricing on Apple drives from like Mac parts resellers online, they are really, really expensive. So unfortunately, yeah. getting it from Apple is still the better solution. It's nice that they've dropped the price a little bit. I still have a hard time with the fact that they ship 128 gigabyte base models. It's, it's time for 256 yeah. as a bare minimum. And really, it should be 512. Well, I, I feel, I feel. I'm going to use feeling words in the group here. Uh, I feel that that's a pretty brutal money grab. Um, you know, because something to talk about here is, you know, yeah, you can the the MacBook Air like 11 and 13 inch from 2013 to 2017, you can update the drive on that. Um, but if you look at, uh, you know, you're basically you need to buy all of the storage you want now because if you click down. You'll see a fantastic iFixit uh, photo of the main board. And uh, that yellow box on the left is the storage. And uh, <laughs> here you're probably not upgrading that unless I'm radically misunderstanding <laughs> what's going on on this device. Um, yeah, and I'm sure somebody's going to be like, well, I could solder that. And like, well, you're a better person than I am, uh, or at least is vastly more talented with a soldering iron. So at the time, you know these 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 parts are going becoming considerably more expensive. Um, you know you can't you upgrading them is, is not even an option. You know you buy the storage now or you're never going to get it. Um, you know the other thing I, I wanted to point out, and again, I, I, as somebody who's pointed out that in many times, you know the idea that there was an Apple tax when you were buying certain things wasn't true. The Apple tax is definitely back um, because when you when you look at like the build to order options. Uh, you know, Apple's got, uh, well, this actually isn't an Apple tax. This is just an over the top workstation. Um, there is a $5,200 option for 256 gigabytes of RAM and Radeon Pro Vega 64X graphics with 16 gigs of dedicated video memory, uh, you know, for a mere $700 upgrade on the iMac Pro. Um, I am just deeply fascinated that you can now get an iMac Pro with 200, uh, 128 or 256 gigabytes of memory and, uh, uh, 256 gigabytes of memory for $5,200. So and that's ECC memory too. And scientific community. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to put that, you know, I, I have no idea where I would even find that much EEC memory, but <laughs> I was just like, wow. Um, that's, that's, that's full on, uh, that's full on like 1993 storage numbers price-wise, or storage prices. Um, and since I've been obsessed with Apple all, all this week with not being obsessed with the future of streaming gaming and the end of consoles, thanks to Google, uh, you know, and again, I was spending a lot of quality time on 9 to 5 Mac this week. They have a gallery of photos of the original iPhone engineering prototype. Um, you know, The Verge actually, I guess, uh, got access to the original engineering prototype used for the engineering validation test sample of the iPhone circa 2006, 2007. Um, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's it, the, really crazy. The original prototype for the iPad made a lot of sense because it essentially looked like a, a current generation like polycarbonate MacBook that had a touchscreen on top of it. But this is... This is like unrecognizable if you're thinking in terms of a phone. Yeah, it's like a looks like an ATX motherboard from like 1998, and there's a little ah. 
touch screen on the bottom corner of it. Well, if you go, I just popped a, a link to the original Verge article. They have this amazing slider that identifies all the different devices on the board. And I was going to say, it doesn't oh, even nice, look yeah. like an ATX motherboard. It looks like some, you know, intense piece of custom industrial controller board. Um, but scroll down from that, that picture and uh, keep going right there. It's crazy. That's like, essentially, there's a, an iPhone display in the corner. And as Kevin slides that back across, you will see, you know, the USB to serial adapter, the LAN port, the LAN chip, uh, they had component video connectors, RCA connectors, uh, you know, the giant jacks in the upper left-hand corner for a serial port, probably for diagnostics. And right below that is massive 3.5 millimeter uh, in and out, uh, you know, the headphone jack uh, and microphone jack. Um, it's kind of crazy to realize that that giant board all ended up fitting inside that round rectangular shape in the lower right-hand corner. So it's uh, it's an interesting bit of history to look at. I, I thought it was kind of fascinating. So I don't know. You know what it, it looks amazed. like? It looks like it looks like a control board for a flat panel TV, which is giving me yeah. some unpleasant flashbacks <laughs> to a. Uh, LG Samsung TV replacement <laughs> project of mine. Oh. Yeah. yeah was the, I know a number of people who did capacitor replacements on Samsungs. Uh, they just need, exciting, they need though. better cooling. We should, uh, we should talk about that sometime. I'll do like a, I, as I will say, when I did replace the control board, the failed board, which died because of heat, there was dust build up and there's absolutely no airflow in these really slim TVs. And uh, I put like high end, like CPU thermal paste, and like reseated all the heat sinks before I even dared to put this thing back together again. But it's good. You know, there's a reason that plasma TVs had active cooling back in the day because <laughs> they were generating a lot of heat. Yeah, uh, and they knew people were going to be really pissed off if they died in two years. So they may have over engineered by current standards. I'm okay with over engineering. It also reminds me that I need to do some modifications to my media closet before the heat, the hot season comes because the temperature in there has uh, been a little higher this winter due to the addition of some new uh, amplification equipment. So, mm. yeah. Well, maybe perhaps we can have a special cooling episode. <laughs> <laughs> Liquid cool your closet. Oh, stranger things will have been done in my life. If this is your first episode of This Week in Computer Hardware, we call it Twitch. And uh, I'm Patrick Norton, and we were also been, you've been listening to that guy on the left there from PC Per, Sebastian Peak. We talk about hardware. We love consoles. We love desktops. We love laptops. We love phones. We love the Internet of Stuff, except when the Internet of Stuff breaks our hearts. And apparently this week, we're really in love with Apple but not the cost of Apple storage. Uh, if you uh, are looking for more, the website you're looking at right now is twit.tv slash twitch. That's twit.tv slash twich. It's got all the information you need on how to subscribe. You can play the older shows directly in there. We do audio versions, video versions on pretty much uh, anything you want to stream them on. We've got a way to get it to you. And uh, we do this each, and we'll record on Thursdays. It shows up like the day after that, and you can get our take on the big news in hardware. And very, very occasionally, we talk about software, but usually in the context of using or testing hardware. Anything uh, you can tease coming up on PC Per this week, sir? Just working through the backlog. No exciting, secretive projects that I can or cannot talk about. Just uh, some case reviews I've been putting off because of all the graphics cards to start off the year. But cases, motherboards, so you know, PC components. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. You can find me over at uh, Tech Thing, T E K T H I N G, my weekly show where I answer questions with Shannon Morris and we talk about hardware. Look, kids, that's a digital photo frame and it's really nice. And uh, I got a little crazy talking about uh, overclocking the TTX 1600 in my attempts to beat the 150 megahertz overclock that Mr. Peak got on his MSI 1660 GPU. You can uh, fire yourself on over to techthing.com and learn about that. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you so much for listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Sebastian Peake. We'll catch you next week on Twitch. Twitch.